Hi there. It's Thursday the 19th. We're back with uh, everybody's favorite um, professional, Professor Gavin Giovanoni. So I'm just going to ask Gavin a couple more questions and we will go into it from there. Most of them are your questions. So again, thank you for helping out. So Gavin, I'll just let you introduce yourself for the people that haven't met you before. Yes, I'm Gavin Giovanoni. I'm the Professor of Neurology at Bart's and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. I'm based at the Whitechapel or the Royal London Hospital site, and we are uh, in the heart of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. People are expecting or have come to expect to be able to contact their teams. How do you think that will change? Well, the teams are not going to be there, uh, or they're going to go on skeleton staff, and so we're going to have to create new solutions to this problem. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, in the last 24 hours, I've created a microsite specifically around how we deal with MS in the, during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And the idea is to try and uh, create a common resource of frequently asked questions and answers. Uh, and these are possibly quite specific to individuals, but if I ask, if I answer a, a question for one of my patients, that may be relevant to 10 or 15 other people out there. So the idea is not to repeat yourself. I mean, the other thing that's going to happen is face-to-face -face consultations. We, we're not allowed to do face-to-face uh, -face consultations unless it's urgent. So we're going to have to shift to, to telephone and uh, video conferencing or whatever. Right. The question is, can we make that even bigger and do uh, like uh, group online clinics to save time and to disseminate information? I think the big issue is going to be new patients. You know, a lot of people have been waiting months to get into the system. Now the system's coming to a grinding halt. Uh, and that's something I'm thinking about what we can do over the next week, literally week, is can we assess new patients, at least triage them via a telephone or webinar consultation, um, mm. and even do, it, even do a rudimentary examination via a video link. And as you know from the experience in Italy, there is a significant number of people that are going to need a acute intensive care bed, and that's what we're trying to do is to lower this peak so that we, we have enough resources. So the, these measures are really there not to protect individuals as such, but to protect uh, the NHS and society. Um, and most people who, who've got MS who get this virus are going to have a mild infection. They're going to get over it without any complications. And I want to stress that I personally ba uh, think, based on the evidence and scientific principles and what's happening in Italy, that the vast majority, and I'm saying the vast majority, 85 or more percent of people with MS who get this virus are going to be absolutely fine. You mentioned when we were talking previously about lymphocyte counts, and I have seen a lot of, shall we say, chatter on the forums, and it's not something I know much about. What is it? What does it matter? I think people who have a lymphocyte count that's important know what it is, but does it mean anything? Should they be doing anything? Yes, it does mean something because the we know that the total lymphocyte count is a very crude measure. And I'll tell you why it's a crude measure, because in your blood, uh, only about 2% of your total lymphocytes are circulating in your blood. So you've got to right. understand that the majority of them are sitting inside lymph nodes, spleen, uh, elsewhere. But anyway, we do know that if you've got a low lymphocyte count, um, and I set the level at 800, if it's below 800, it puts you at increased risk of what we call opportunistic. These are infections that you normally wouldn't get if you had a, a normal immune system. So people who've got a, a total lymphocyte count above 800 do well, in a sense. So you, ideally, you'd like your lymphocyte count to be above 800. That doesn't mean to say if you've got a lymphocyte count of 400 or 500 and you get this infection, you're going to do badly because we know from clinical trials, just to give you an example, with cladribine, uh, we had a large number of people that had lymphocyte counts of below 500. They got viral infections and they were fine. So on average, though, you're more likely to get a severe viral infection if you've got a low lymphocyte count. Right. There's also um, another caveat, though. Uh, people who are on the class of drugs, Fingolimid, which is the trade name Gelenia, that mm -hmm. actually works by trapping lymphocytes in lymph nodes. And the lymphocyte count in that class of drugs, which we call the S1P modulators, the fingerseen one phosphate modulators, okay, the lymphocyte count doesn't correlate with infections. So in that class of drug, just ignore the lymphocyte count. As long as it's above 200, it doesn't mean anything. Perhaps you could tell us there's a lot of concern. Uh, who is vulnerable and who isn't vulnerable in the MS group? Who should really take care and who is not so, uh, you know, not so vulnerable? Yeah, so... I think people who are not on treatment, um, as far as I'm aware, there is no problem with people who are not on any therapy 
um, been vulnerable to viral infections or severe viral infections. So I think people who are not on treatment should just treat themselves as being normal from an immune perspective mm-hmm. and should be able to deal with this virus like anybody else. That doesn't mean to say they're not going to get severe infection because there's a small percentage of patients that get severe infections and it's re- linked to age, smoking history, hypertension, and other things. So those things will sp- still apply to people with multiple sclerosis. Then we get to people on treatment, and I would divide those up into vulnerable and super vulnerable, you know, the high vulnerable group. But the high vulnerable group, in my opinion, is very limited. It's probably limited to people who had uh, HACT or alemtuzumab in the last three to six months uh, who've still got uh, immune depletion and their lymphocyte counts are still very, very low. I say three to six months because it's a grayscale. You know, as your lymphocyte counts come back, your vulnerability drops off. And this is why the lymphocyte counts are important. Uh, okay. uh, uh, so, um, so the only people that really have to, you know, self-isolate and stop themselves getting exposed would be those people in, the, in that particular group. I think the rest of people on immunosuppressive should just, you know, practice the hygiene and uh, social yep. distancing. I think they've got to realize that this, I mean, to be honest with you, this particular epidemic may not just last six, eight weeks. It may last months. And so, you know, from a practical perspective, you can't socially isolate for the next six to 12 months. You have to be practical yeah. about these things. So when you say isolate, that subset, the people that have just been at CT or um, alemtuzumab in the last three, you know, three to six months and their lymphocyte count depending, how long should they be looking to really enforce their isolation? I mean, I, w- I would say it's probably three to four months because right. by, okay. by by four months, most people that have had alemtuzumab or HACT are reconstituted to agree right. when they, if they got an infection, they will be, they will deal with it. Right. Um, but but I I'm saying this though, um, those people will probably be having their blood tests done and they'll be able to ask their healthcare professional, the neurologist or the hematologist. Right. You know, what is my total white cell count and what is my lymphocyte count? And so as soon as they get an idea that their lymphocyte counts have got above 500, hopefully above 800, they will, they will, they will uh, be reassured that their immune systems are uh, reconstituted to a point that they can deal with most infections. Have you guys, as in the neurology community, got any sort of a handle on the amount of people with MS and on DMTs that have been treated or people on ms with ms that are not on dmts that have been infected do you guys are you starting to build a picture have you got a handle on this just sort of knowledge wise yeah so um first of all the the uk ms registry study in the first day they recruited over 1000 patients and five of them have had the infection right so i don't know i don't know how well they've done but five people volunteered Mm-hmm. The Italians, um, I don't know if you've been following on Twitter, there's cases coming out on Twitter. And, yeah. and fortunately, all the ones that have come out, there's been two ocrelizumab, one rituximab, one cladribine, one alemtuzumab, a fingolimid, an interferon, uh, a DMF one. So they, we're seeing these case reports and the neurologists who are on Twitter are saying these patients are all doing fine. So that's quite reassuring. But I don't think we should use social media and six or seven cases to judge this, okay? And the reason why I'm reserved, I don't know if you know, but the severe complications of the COVID-19 is not in the first week. In the first week, you just have this flu-like illness with the cough, muscles, muscle, right. pain, pain, muscle. It's the second week when your immune response kicks in, and that's what causes the damage. We think the damage right. is actually uh, related to an immune response to the virus, and that t- typically occurs in the second week at around about day 10 to day 14. And that's probably an immune mediated uh, response. So these patients may be in the, the first week. So we don't know what's going to happen to those patients in the second week. This is why we think actually being on an immunosuppressive therapy may, may actually prevent severe uh, complications because it's dampening down that immune response. And I t- keep telling people that fingolimogelenia has actually been tested in China right now to try and prevent or delay that second uh, wow. week response. So the jury is completely out. People with multiple sclerosis actually as a group on disease-modifying treatment do better than people who are not on disease-modifying therapy because their immune systems are slightly uh, uh, compromised by the drugs they're on. So um, this is why we are in an evidence-free space. I think we need to keep our heads, uh, understand uh, that this is a fast-moving field, and hopefully these registers will give us data in the next week or two to reassure patients. Well, that concludes another interesting episode uh, in these fast-moving times. We really appreciate you viewing the video. 
We really appreciate you sharing it. And you know that you can do all the usual liking and subscribing and all that kind of stuff down there. We'll be back with some more videos. We've got a couple of really interesting people teed up and we will be back probably roughly weekly. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Take care.